Hello, welcome to the video. My name is Nick Lapham and uh, today I'll be covering a question on altimetry. So if you are doing meteorology or flight planning, um, I hope there'll be one or two useful things that you can get out of this video. It's not the hardest altimetry question you'll ever see, but um, I know a lot of our students struggle with altimetry as a concept. Please follow along with me as I read the question. An aircraft on a track of 240 magnetic has to overfly an obstacle of 25,700 feet with a clearance of 2,000 feet. The QNH is 1033 hectopascals. Your outside air temperature is ISO minus 20. What is the minimum flight level at which the aircraft may fly in RVSM airspace? And then we've got four possible answers, which uh, don't mean a lot to us at this stage. First thing I'd like to address is the methodology that we would use to answer these questions. Um, I'd like you to remember the word PIT, with P standing for pressure altitude, I for indicated altitude, and T for true altitude. Um, and you'll notice that I've put a green arrow that goes from left to right. Why have I done that? Well, the usual way of using this formulation is to start with a pressure altitude, change it to an indicated, and then to a true. You can use this backwards, starting with a true, going to an indicated, and then to a pressure. But when you do the calculation to go from true to indicated, when you're going backwards, you're going to have to reverse um, whatever the outcome of that calculation is, which I'll explain in more detail just now. Now, uh, what do these three different terms mean? Well, your pressure altitude is uh, what's going to be reflected on your altimeter if you set 1013 into your altimeter subscale. Um, your indicated altitude, on the other hand, is is your altitude above mean sea level, which of course is a useful thing to know since uh, all of the obstacles around you are also going to be compared to mean sea level. Now, how do you get your indicated altitude? Well, that would be um, whatever your altimeter is telling you if you set the local Q and H into your altimeter subscale. And then your true altitude, um, you'll notice is also based on your Q and H, but I've put a C there, which stands for a correction um, that's necessary, uh, because there is a usually a discrepancy between your true altitude and your indicated altitude. And why would that be? Well, your altimeter is a, is a bit of a flawed device in the fact that it is calibrated according to the international standard atmosphere. Now, according to ISA, in the lower layers of the atmosphere, your pressure should fall off at a rate of uh, 1 hectopascal as to 27 feet. Uh, and so your altimeter will, when it detects uh, a pressure reduction of 1 hectopascal, it will think, oh, I've gone up by 27 feet. The trouble, of course, is that more often than not, conditions are, are not conducive to the international standard atmosphere. And so what you'll find is that when conditions are warmer than ISA, the atmosphere will tend to expand and uh, your pressure will fall off slower with altitude. And the reverse will happen in conditions colder than ISA, where the atmosphere tends to contract and pressure falls off quite quickly with altitude. So to try and simplify that, suppose that maybe in, when conditions are colder than ISA, your pressure would be falling off at 25 feet per hectopascal. But now your altimeter thinks the pressure will be falling off at 27 feet per hectopascal. So there's going to be a discrepancy between what your altimeter thinks and what is truly happening. Now that is most dangerous in conditions that are colder than ISA, because your, your altimeter is going to give you a false confidence. It's going to be telling you that you're higher than you actually are, which of course places you closer to any obstacles. Now, 
if we uh, wanted to change our pressure altitude to an indicated altitude, we would do something called a barometric correction. That's a fancy way of saying we've changed the figure that was in our altimeter subscale um, from 1013 to Q and H. And so what, what will indication will our altimeter be giving us when we do that change? And then um, going from our indicator to our true altitude, we do something called a temperature error correction where we compensate for, compensate for non-standard temperatures. I did mention earlier that you can work backwards from true altitude via indicated altitude to pressure altitude, uh, but when you do this temperature error correction, you're going to have to reverse the, the sign. So if you get a negative figure out of that, you're going to have to add it. Okay, so let's try and get a clearer image of what the scenario in the question is portraying. So here we've got our mean sea level, where our QNH is 1033, and we've got quite a big mountain uh, which measures 25,700 feet above mean sea level. And then we have to clear that mountain by 2,000 feet. So the height that our aircraft is truly at has to be 27,700 feet. Um, but now, what is our altimeter going to be telling us when we set the Q&H for us to be at, a tr at this true altitude? Well, if conditions were ISA, they would be exactly the same thing. But because conditions are 20 degrees colder than ISA, then we would expect that our indicated altitude is going to be higher than our true altitude. Now, to find out what our indicated altitude is going to be, we need to do a temperature error correction. And there's a formula that gives us a good approximation of what that uh, correction would be. So that, and that's four times our indicated altitude uh, in thousands of feet multiplied by our ISA deviation. Um, so in this case, it's four times 27.7, our true altitude there, multiplied by minus 20. Now, I said indicated altitude here. That's not entirely true. Um, what we would do is, is actually measure the temperature error correction within the band of atmosphere that exists between where our aircraft is and where the Q&H was measured. Now, our question doesn't say anything about where the Q&H was measured. And so what we're going to do is assume that it was measured at um, mean sea level. Some questions might actually tell you the Q and H has come from an airfield that was at a certain elevation, in which case you're only going to do, apply the temperature error correction for the band of atmosphere between that airfield and where the aircraft um, is flying. But in this case we assume it's mean sea level. So do that calculation and we get an answer of minus 2,216 feet. Now, as I've said a few times now, when we go from true to indicated, we're going to reverse this sign. So we're actually going to add this 2,200 to our true altitude. Um, and doing that calculation, we'd find that our indicated altitude is 29,916 feet. Now, does that figure make sense? So if our altimeter with the Q&H set was telling us this, um, and if conditions were colder than ISA, we'd expect our true altitude to actually be lower, then that actually does look correct at this stage. Now we want to change this indicated into a pressure altitude, so we need to do a barometric correction. So our mean sea level is down here with a QNH of 1033, and we want to change the figure in the altimeter subscale to 1013. So how is the reading on our altimeter going to change? Um, so for that, we do our barometric correction, which is um, the difference between our Q&H and 1013. And that works out to 20 hectopascals. Um, 
And so we work out 20 hectopas 20 hectopascals times 30 feet per hectopascal. I haven't made mention of this figure 30 yet. So when I was talking about um, the international standard atmosphere earlier, I had said that your altimeter expects that the pressure will drop off at a rate of 27 feet per hectopascal. Now, that figure was recently revised in the most recent update to the syllabus. It was revised to 30 feet. And I think that's mostly just for simplicity. A more accurate figure to use it would be 27, but um, we have to use 30. Uh, a rule of thumb is if, uh, if the question doesn't state what you should use for this figure, then just assume 30. If it specifically says use 27, then you should use 27. So um, working this out, 20 times uh, 30 should give you 600 feet. So if we knew that, that this band of atmosphere was 29,916 feet to mean sea level, and we knew that the difference between 1033 and 1013, this band of atmosphere would be 600 feet, then the rest of it would be our pressure altitude, in which case it would come to 29,316 feet. Um, so what does this figure mean? Well, basically, this would have to be showing, um, at a minimum, this would have to be showing on our altimeter with 1013 set in order for us to clear that mountain um, with 2,000 feet to spare. Right, let's uh, look at what else the question has asked. So it said, what is the minimum flight level at which an aircraft may fly in RVSM airspace? Okay, well, to answer that, we need to be familiar with ICAO semicircular rules. So if we are flying below flight level 290, um, if we were on a magnetic track of between 000, flying in an easterly direction, between 000 and 179, we would fly at an odd flight level. And if we were between 180 and around to 359, then we'd fly at an even flight level. And the point of that is to introduce a uh, mandatory 1,000 foot separation between aircraft that are flying on reciprocal tracks. Um, so if I was, if one aircraft was flying at 070 in an easterly direction, another aircraft going a westerly direction would have to be either be at 60 or 80. So there's a 1,000 foot separation there. Now the rules change um, when you get to flight level 290 and above in which case that separation that was a thousand foot will now be increased to two thousand feet. So starting from flight level 290, which was an odd level, if we added two thousand feet to that, the next available level would be flight level 310, and if we added two thousand feet to that, it's 330, and so on. Um, and that introduces a new world of confusion because the these figures you'll notice are not actually even numbers but we do still refer to them as even levels so this is the way that things normally are um, according to ICAO semicircular rules now how do you remember which direction is odd and even well the way I've always done it is if you look up here starting from zero 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 if you punch that into a digital calculator, that sort of looks like the word odd. So just remember, from 000, going the right way around the compass to 179, it's written there, basically, odd. Right, now moving on to RVSM airspace. Well, what is that? RVSM airspace only exists within certain regions between flight level 290 and flight level 410. And within that particular airspace, which your aircraft would have to have the appropriate conditions, sorry, it's correct, sorry, it would have to have the appropriate equipment and would have to be certified in order to fly within RVSM airspace. Um, that would exist between flight level 290 and 410, in which case that 
separation, which, which was 2,000 feet, would be reduced to 1,000 feet. And that sort of restores a bit of sanity to your levels here, because um, if you were flying um, on westerly tracks, your numbers would remain even. So it would be level 300, level 320, 340, and that that continues all the way up to flight level 410. And then from 410 onwards, um, that there's a mandatory 2,000 foot. So there's no RVSM above 410. So RVSM basically changes the rules. But you can only fly in that airspace if your aircraft is adequately equipped. So uh, we had figured out that our altimeter would have to be showing 29,316 feet with 1013 as the relevant pressure datum in order for us to clear um, the, the top of the obstacle with 2,000 feet. And so we have to be at a flight level that is above this figure. Um, and our aircraft is flying on a track of 240 magnetic so we would also have to be at an even flight level. So what is the next available even flight level above 29,316 feet? Well, that would be flight level 300. So let's go back to our available answers. And uh, it looks like answer D would be the correct answer in this scenario. So I hope uh, you've managed to get something useful out of this video. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments and uh, I should get around to giving you an answer on that. But otherwise, thanks for listening and I'll see you on the next video. Bye-bye.